I heard you. <laughs> well, you know, I really, uh, I really thought we would have this place packed out like we did in 2013. And uh, some of the folks never came back. We must have made them mad, I guess. <laughs> but I think the Lord has here who he wants here. And uh, so I'm happy about that. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that we need to have a broad understanding of who God's people are. Yeah. And uh, we're all on the same team. But we want to, if we're part of a team that's all over the world, we want to be the best part we can. And uh, so that's basically why we're gathered. <clears throat> and um, so almost everybody here, at some time or another, has gone through the training program that we have. That started way back in 1960. One. So there's a lot of people out there that aren't here today that, that uh, have been through that. <clears throat> and some of them are really wonderfully going on with the Lord, and some of them are kind of kind of harboring little bitter thoughts and so forth for one reason or another. And um, so we got a lot of... Uh, things to pray for, but uh, I, I'm just so happy. I had a, a guy asked me one time, this is a, a man, one of our students from Korea, and uh, he uh, has been very successful in his own way, and he has churches all over the world, and so he was kind of poking at me one time, and he said, how many churches do you have in America? And I said, well, none. None. How many churches do you have in Mexico? None. And so what have you been doing? <laughs> so, so I'm just happy to report today that we don't have any churches. <laughs> and uh, we don't have any reputation. But somewhere out there, there's a lot of seed that's been sown. In. And uh, one thing I know is that everything we plant grows. And uh, uh, if we plant good seed, there'll be good fruit. And if we plant weeds, there are going to be a lot of weeds. And it's about my experience that we go about kind of planting both. You know, even inadvertently, we plant a few weeds and, and the weeds come up. And uh, so we need to be really careful in our lives what we plant. And it's not what we see, it's what we plant. And so we're just uh, praising the Lord for that. And we're going to <clears throat> start this morning by talking about uh, availability. That's really been on my heart. And so we'll take a few minutes to talk about that. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you this morning that you are so gracious. Lord, you've given us opportunity, a lifetime, Lord, to simply serve you. And Lord, as we look to you, Father, I, I just thank you that we can give you the glory and Lord, we thank you, Father, that you've been patient with us as we um, have followed you, sometimes inconsistently. And yet, Lord, you've been gracious, and you hold our hand, and you bring us along, and we thank you for that. <clears throat> so, Father, this morning, I just pray that you would take charge of every moment of this day today. Everything that is added by anyone, I pray that it might have your seal upon it. And Lord, that you would bless today. So I want to commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we're, um, we're talking about availability. And uh, 
I looked up in the dictionary to see what available means. <laughs> and I had a good idea what it means, but I thought I would look it up and see what it officially means. And uh, it's from the word avail. And uh, I'll just read this to you. From avail, to assist <clears throat> or to aid, to be of value or advantage, capable of being used at hand, usable, ready to be used, as in prepared to be used. So that's availability, to be on hand, to be standing by and ready and equipped. <clears throat> so I think that uh, that's where we want to be. We want to be available. The opportunities today of, of ministering to a world are just innumerable. And the Lord has told us to pray the Lord of the harvest He'd send forth laborers because he said the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And uh, so we understand one thing, that God has always worked with a few laborers. So there's always more to be done than is being done. <clears throat> and yet there's kind of a time limit on all of these things. God knows exactly when the date is that all of these things are going to, to uh, culminate. And I am suspicious that maybe we're very close to the end of that time. And uh, the reason I think so is because the word is divided up into weeks. There's weeks of hours and our days and there's weeks of months and there's weeks of years all set forth in the, in the word. Daniel is made up of weeks of years. And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, time. I concluded this. I don't know if my conclusions are exactly accurate or not, but I, I concluded that time, the whole span, is a week. And that uh, it's broken up into seven millennia. <clears throat> and... We've just about finished six of them, and we're all ready to go into the seventh. And the seventh one, of course, is the kingdom. So uh, Jesus had said when he left that uh, he was coming back. And in, in uh, Hosea, it says that he was going to go away, and he was going to be gone for two days, and the third day, he would live in Israel's sight. <clears throat> and in the uh, course of the parables, he talks about the Good Samaritan coming upon a man who had been beaten up by the priests and by the religious. And, and he took him to the inn, and he told the caretaker to look after this man. And he gave him two days' wages and said... Uh, when I come back, if you've spent more than that, I'll uh, repay you. And looking at all of those things, I came to a conclusion. I think it's probably accurate, but maybe I don't want to uh, uh, say that I know a date, because I don't. <clears throat> but I know an approximation, I think. And I think that... Uh, if the Lord comes back exactly 2,000 years after he left, that's pretty soon. That's pretty soon. So I'm going with that. I don't know if that's good doctrine or not, but I know that, uh, I know that we're ready, and I'm planning to maybe see the Lord as old as I am. Uh, maybe I'll be still here when he comes, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And if I happen to leave before, then it'll only be shortly after that you'll be joining me. So I just uh, realized that things are getting pretty exciting. We're getting, we're getting down to the end. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid, I was uh, kind of afraid of dying because I thought I'd miss something. <laughs> now I'm uh, kind of looking forward to it so that, because I know that uh, I'm not going to miss anything. <clears throat>
except maybe some hard stuff. So, well, Lord, we just pray that you'll direct our speech. Okay, so in general, we're just one, one body. And I know there's a lot of competition out there between ministries, but we don't want to be involved in that. We're one body, and that body is all over the world. <clears throat> and we have one general calling. Corporately, we have one general calling. We don't have to wonder what that is. It's laid out very clearly in the 12th chapter of Romans. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds for this purpose, that you may prove or demonstrate to the whole world what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Okay, that's the only thing we have to do. There's nothing else in the world that we have to do or should be distracted from that. We are to demonstrate what is the good and perfect, acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we, have, we, have, we know what our commission is. And what impresses me about that is Paul said, I beseech you. He didn't say, I command you. And all of those important things that demonstrate God to the world are not done by law. They're not done by commandment. They're done by the volition of the presenters. Brethren, I beseech you that you, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And the striking thing about that is, brethren, plural, I beseech you, plural, that's y'all. Yeah. Like they say in Texas, y'all. And if you're only talking to one person, you, or to more than one person, you say, all y'all. <laughs> but uh, Paul is saying that I beseech you that you all, that's what ye is, it's a plural word, present your bodies, plural, a sacrifice, singular. And that's, uh, I think that's important to see because it, all of us are called upon to surrender our bodies, to present our body, a living sacrifice. But collectively, he's talking to the whole church because together that whole body is a singular living sacrifice that is holy and that is uh, separate from the world, sanctified to God, and that's what the church is supposed to be. The church only does that as the individual members submit to that. And that's what God has called us to do, to see ourselves as a body of believers totally submitted. And God has called us to that. <clears throat> In Romans 6, uh, 6, he talks about that same thing. He says, I call you to yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So this whole thing isn't a matter of energy on our part, it's a matter of yielding to his energy so that he can use our body for his work. He's the head, we're the body. And to be not conformed, yeah, that's true, we're a peculiar people. Peculiar people doesn't mean weird, it means separated, a singular people who are a singular object peculiar to one owner. That's what that word peculiar means. So when we come to the place where we are divided, where we think somehow that we have a part in this world system, rather than being peculiarly his instrument and belonging only to him, that's where we begin to get all muddled up because we get our agenda, his agenda, in competition with each other in our own hearts. And so there comes the confusion and the 
susceptibility to all of the devastating things that Satan would throw at us. So, he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here's a verse that I memorized when I was first saved. One of the first verses I memorized. <clears throat> and yet recently I understood it. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, um, I remember memorizing this, um, that uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, that's, that's good poetry and it's good theology, but I didn't know what it meant. <clears throat> and I think we start to learn what it means. If we're a new creature, we're part of a new creation. And as I read Hebrews, I realize that everything new came because everything old is passing away. So the new and the old doesn't mingle. This is not like putting a patch on an old garment from a new garment. So, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Well, so what? So old things have passed away. Really? Yeah, all things have become new. Wow, that's a new way of looking at everything, a new economy, a new, a new world situation. Everything is different. And I think that's one of the things we don't grasp. So we keep running around as though we were the same old man trying to act like the new man. You ever done that? So here we are, we think we're sons of Adam trying to act like sons of God. And we're not. Adam died. Adam was put to death. You're not a son of Adam anymore. Now you're a son of God. Oh, wow. Not only that, the world has been dealt with and you're in a new economy. Well, how come we're just muddling along trying to apply all of the things of the new life to the old life? You can't do that. And as long as we're doing that, we're not available because we're, we're still hooked up to a thing that simply becomes an interference to what God has called us to do. So, well, that should be obvious because the scripture says that when he created Adam, he created him in his image. And... It never struck me for a long time what that meant either. That when Adam was created, he was the image of God. So, and I've said this so many times, because I'm becoming conscious that all of these beginnings affect everything that we do, everything that we are. And Adam wasn't like us. And so we recognize that if Adam wasn't like us, what was Adam like? Well, according to Genesis 1.26, he was like God. Wow. You know, I always had the idea, and I think I got this idea from preachers. <laughs> I always got the idea that Adam was kind of a bumbling idiot back there that just kind of was, you know, making up his own mind, doing his own thing. And, and uh, Adam was something that I, I didn't hold in very high esteem. And Jesus was the man. But when I begin to look at what the Bible says, I realize that what Adam was created to be was exactly what Jesus was. So if I said, what was Adam like? I would have to say, well, Adam was like Jesus. And he was like Jesus until he made that fatal decision under the deception of Satan to try to be like God. And I think, wow, 
Adam didn't understand who he was. Adam didn't understand that he was like God. And Satan came along and said, if you will eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can be just like God without God. And so that was the deception. The deception was that you can be what God wants you to be if you'll just make yourself independent of God. And what happens then is everything, all the restrictions, all of the things that God would have us to be and do become bondage to us because they interfere with our own liberty, our own free will, our own agenda. And so all of a sudden, by having his own way and by eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam was separated from God. Adam became a competitor of God because God, Satan had convinced him that God was a competitor of him. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge, you can be just like God. And why did God tell you not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Because you'll be just like God. God doesn't want you to be just like him. That would be competition to God. God wants you to be under his control. So Adam, if you eat of the knowledge of good and evil, you can be just like God. So all of a sudden, there was this new thought and the thought was that somehow good and evil plays into the thing about making us like God. If we're going to operate on a good and evil system, it makes us like the devil, not like God. Why did Adam have to know good and evil? He was the image of God. Oh, let's talk about image. What's an image? Well, if you look in a mirror, what do you see? Well, some people say, well, I see myself. You don't see yourself. You just see an image of yourself. And you know, that image doesn't initiate anything. Everything that's in the original is in the image, except life except the ability to initiate. And everything that's not in the original is not in the image. And if the original moves, the image moves. If the original stands perfectly still, the image is perfectly still. And the image doesn't do anything that the original doesn't do. And the image does everything that the original does. That's an image. Am I making any sense here? Okay. So when we look at the whole purpose for the creation of humanity, the purpose was to be the image of God. What if suddenly the image you're looking at had an agenda of its own and did something you didn't do? You know what your reaction would be? It would scare you to death. You'd leave the bathroom and run out of there. <laughs> because it's not normal that the image should do anything that the original doesn't do. Okay, now... When God made us in his image, or made man in his image, that image had nothing to do except what God was doing. It had no ability to initiate. It had nothing. Until it was tempted to embrace the whole idea of the knowledge of good and evil. Why would you need the knowledge of good and evil? So that I can do good. Why would you want to do good? So that I can be like God. Ah, oh, got it. Okay. So you think that if you do good, you're being godly. 
And if you do evil, you're being ungodly. What would you think if I told you that if you're doing good or evil, you're ungodly? If it's not the will of God. Because the only thing that man has to do is to demonstrate the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Good has nothing to do with it. Evil has nothing to do with it. The will of God has everything to do with it. So, what do I want to be available for? Well, I just want to stand as the image inside the mirror and respond to everything that the original outside the mirror is doing. And when man was told that he could be good by doing good, or he was evil by doing evil, he was being deceived. He was being righteous if he was, if God was working in him. Listen to this. This is the redeemed man. It's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And <clears throat> so the man was the vehicle in which God goes. Or the man was the glove that the hand wears. Or he was the clothes that God wears to work, as Ian Thomas said. And if those clothes began to walk around without the human in them, or if those clothes had an agenda that was opposite to the agenda of the person that was wearing them, that would be quite a demonstration. So we recognize then that everything, I wrote, I wrote this down, everything therefore that the vehicle, the glove, the clothes, the tools do is simply a visible reflection of what is being done in them, not by them. And so this is the matter of where availability comes in. We don't have an agenda of our own. We want to be absolutely available to the agenda of God. And because God is efficient, God is good, our intelligence, our ability, all of these things have really nothing to do with our following God. And this was the problem of, of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, I'm just a child. And God said, you go, you tell the nations what I tell you. And Jeremiah felt totally inadequate to do that. Moses, God said, go speak to Pharaoh. He says, I can't speak. God said, who made your mouth? Mm -hmm. So Isaiah, he touched his lips. I have put my words in your mouth. All of these, all of these people were, were, in their own estimation, totally ill-equipped, totally unable to do anything that God chose them for. And God, in essence, said, that's why I chose you. I want this to be of me, not of you. And so we are in a place where we have to have a view of God and of our relationship to him that makes him absolutely everything and makes us absolutely nothing. And all we have to be is available to what God wants to do in us and through us. And if we have an agenda contrary to his, then all of a sudden it doesn't work. So, this being so, our objective is not how to do things for God, but to understand yielding or letting go, even when it's scary or it seems irrational, we need to do that so that he can do his work in us. And we're, I think we, two problems 
Number one, we have too high an opinion of ourselves. And number two, we have too low an opinion of God. And we're, we're looking at this song. That's why that hymn impressed me so much this morning. And I hadn't even paid any attention to the man who wrote it, what his name was. Daniel Towner. I never knew that till this morning. I looked over there to look and see who wrote that. Because I was suddenly impressed with, this is so profound. <clears throat> I remember singing that when I was a little kid in a Baptist Sunday school up in Vancouver, B.C., Trust and Obey. And I thought, wow, that's a weary sounding song. <laughs> we, we, said, we said, I don't remember whether we sat for that one or stood for that one, but, but I remember that some hymns you stand up for and some hymns you sit down for, and, uh, and uh, I just don't remember whether we stood for trust and obey or sat down for it, but it didn't mean anything to me. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I've sung it many times over the years, and it's be it began to mean more to me. But this morning as we sang it, I was so impressed. There are only two things, you trust and you obey. And that means that when it's scary, you trust and you obey. When it's irrational to everybody around you, you trust and you obey. Wow, what a simple formula. How do you live the Christian life? You trust and you obey. Yeah, but that'll bring reproach. That's true. They hated me, so they'll hate you also. So that's where, we're, that's where we are. But here's what happens. We have this good and evil thing. And saints, I don't know about you, but I can, I can say this, that there's a remnant of that that still clings. And we're trying to do good. We're trying to be righteous. Righteousness is of him. And so we get an idea. Well, how does a Christian act? Well, if a Christian is a businessman, then he's a good businessman. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Good, evil. Wouldn't want to be an evil businessman. And if he's an athlete, how do you glorify God? You're a good athlete. Wow, this guy is a Hall of Famer, and he's a Christian. Wow, we need him on our team. Why? Because he's a Christian? No, because he's a Hall of Famer Christian. <laughs> so we've got, uh, we've got this idea of good. You've got to be good at it. Well, let me say something about that. To be good at something takes time. It takes practice. It takes energy. It takes concentration. And many of those things interfere and make us unavailable for the will of God. Why are we unavailable? Well, because we're busy trying to be the best we can at what we do. Why? Because that's how we glorify God. But what if God taps you on the shoulder and said, hey, get out of the gym, get off the ball court, get out of your business thing, get out of this because I have something for you to do. I can't because I'm too busy trying to be good at what I do. Why? So that I can glorify you. God says, you know what? You don't glorify me at being good at something. You glorify me by demonstrating what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And very often it has nothing to do with what you're trying to be good at. So, oh, you're trying to tell us then that we should be a bunch of jerks and not be good at what we do? No. 
Not at all. I'm telling you that there has to be a motivation. There has to be something that motivates me not to be good, not to be in the Hall of Fame, but something that motivates me to be absolutely available to whatever the Holy Spirit is telling me to do right now. But what if it interferes with this thing I'm being good at? It might destroy it altogether. Saints, we've been taught over the years that we're supposed to find out God's agenda and then try to do it for him. That's not how it works. This is a moment by moment walk with God, like the glove on the hand. It doesn't have its own agenda, like the clothes that God wears. They don't have their own agenda. God has the agenda. So, well, what about the thing we've been talking about here, about uh, God may tell some of us to go and he may tell some of us to stay. Why would God have me in, in the plumbing trade if he wants me to glorify him? How can I glorify him in the plumbing trade? Oh, well, why are you a plumber? Well, basically because plumbers make more money than doctors do. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's your motivation? Yeah, because if I have a good job that pays a lot of money, I can give more to God's work. Oh. God's broke? <laughs> so we have all of these things that revolve around us that we think that are godly or righteous or that, that do the things that God wants done. I think that the reason you're a plumber is because that's the venue that God thinks he can use you best right now. And why then am I in this plumbing job where my boss is so poor he pays me an inferior wage? You got nothing to do with your boss. God's got you there because he wants you there to manifest him. But I could make more money over there. Yeah, but that's got nothing to do with it. Do you want the will of God or do you want money? Okay, these are the two economies and these work against us all the time. The economy of this world is money. The economy of the kingdom of God is faith. And so... Our availability to God, whatever I'm doing has to do with motivation. I'm there because God has me there. How do you know God wants you there? Well, because I'm there. If God wanted me somewhere else, I'd be somewhere else. So I can comfortably say that where I am, I'm to be what God wants me to be. And the scriptures say, that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Where? Both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. Oh, what does it say I'm supposed to do? Witness? No, it doesn't say anything about what you're supposed to do. The verb to do doesn't even appear in that verse. It's the verb to be. So wherever God has placed me, he has placed me there to be the image of God demonstrating the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I'm available for that purpose. But are you available to go to the mission field? Well, of course, if I'm available to be the image of God, I'm available, as the song said this morning, to go where he wants me to go, to do what he wants me to do. But it all hinges on whether I'm being what he wants me to be. And if God is my employer, he can take me off of one venue and put me in another. 
He can take me from being a plumber in New Jersey to being a preacher of the gospel in Bangladesh. Same employer, same job, manifesting the image of God. And until we come to the place where we recognize that and realize that because God supplied for me to have an education in brain surgery and he's placed me in John Hopkins Hospital where I make a lot of money, God's able to say, hey, brain surgeon, I'm going to send you off to the jungles of South America. And I want you to bury yourself among 25 aborigines who've never heard the name of Jesus. Oh, but Lord, I'm important. You've given me a great position. Yeah, but you're only important as long as that's my will. But the instant you refuse to do my will, you're not important anymore. And when you go and bury yourself with those 25 aborigines down in the jungle of South America, you'll be important because you'll be in the center of my will. Okay, so availability has to do <clears throat> with where we are and what, who we are in where, in where we are. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> before, notice the difference. In the original, the purpose was to be God's image. After sin, the options provided are to be good or to do evil. And God's image is no, not among those options. Because as a dead man, I can't do them. That's why I had to receive the redemption of God. So that then I had two different options, to do the will of God or not to do the will of God. And so had nothing to do with good or evil saints. All of those things proceed from the Lord. <clears throat> okay, to be available now is the important thing. Really important for us now because we're living now. And there's all kinds of things going on in the world today that are harbingers of the end. And sometimes we feel detached. I've heard people say that the news of today has nothing to do with us. Well, of course it does. We live in the world. What's happening in our country? Well, the same thing that's happening in all third world countries all over the world. And that is that the enemy is coming in like a flood. And we see things on the news. We see, uh, for example, I don't know if you heard this. I, I heard it publicly on the news, and it seems that some people never caught it. But the guy who just finished uh, dispatching those uh, nine people, I think it was nine, in Roseburg, this wasn't just random shooting. This guy asked them what religion they had before he shot them. And if they had any religion, they're okay. But if they said they were Christians, they were shot. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. So this was a target at Christians. Now, where would a spirit like that come from in America? Well, I watch the news every night and I see all of the faces of the poor crying children and the mothers. And that's what we're supposed to concentrate on, these poor people. We better open our doors and receive them because look, they're babies and they're mothers. No, they're not. That's a front. I mean, they're innocent. I mean, I don't want to disparage that. But behind that whole thing is something far more sinister than that. Our government went in and destabilized the whole Middle East. Destabilized Egypt, destabilized Syria, 
destabilized Iraq, making deals with Iran. And then the people start flooding. Who starts flooding? Well, some families and thousands and thousands of young jihadists who are flooding Europe, flooding America, flooding Australia. Wow, what wonderful timing. <laughs> Saints, we need to be aware of what's going on. Oh, we should tremble? No, we shouldn't tremble. We should realize that the enemy is coming in like a flood. What's God going to do? He's going to raise up a standard against him. Who's the standard going to be? It's going to be the saints that are available to God's working. Amen. It's not going to be those who are promoting religion or advancing their denominations or promoting their work. It's going to be those who are open to the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's going to be powerless people. It's going to be nobodies. It's going to be the despised and the hated. It's going to be those who have chosen to suffer the reproach of Christ rather than to, to uh, enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It's going to be those of us saints who are available to the working of God. It's going to be those of us who are willing to be gloves and work clothes and tools that the master can either pick up or lay down at his discretion. God has called us saints to be available. Nothing's going to interfere with our available to God, whether it's our occupation, whether it's our sport, whether it's our fame, whether it's our finances. Nothing is going to stand in my heart in opposition to the present tense will of God. So I have nothing that I will cling to above what God is instructing me to do. It's God that works in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And saints, that's what availability is all about. And I have to come to the place where I know that my motive for being where I am, doing what I'm doing, earning what I'm earning, saying what I'm saying, being what I'm being is strictly because I know it to be the will of God. I have no other motives. And when God says, it's time for you to put your tools in your box, to buy your ticket, to do whatever it is to do, I'm available. I'm totally available. God may tell me to stay where I am forever until the day I die. But if I'm staying where I am, it's because it's the will of God. And what I'm doing there is I'm demonstrating and manifesting the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, no matter what it costs me. This is what availability is all about. <clears throat> we know what's happening. The Bible said it was going to happen. The Bible told us, Paul told us, Peter told us, Jesus told us that all of the things that are happening today were going to happen. And the present conditions, economics, look at the economics of our country. I was told just the other day that, well, we're on the next bubble. And when this one pops, it's all over. I heard that from a businessman who isn't even a Christian, but he's able to observe the sky. Yeah. <clears throat> so, starting now, we don't want to be preoccupied with the things of the flesh. We don't want to be preoccupied with our comfort, our personal gain, our pleasure, our survival, etc. Here, listen to this verse. 
He that will save his life shall lose it. But he that will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Now, I don't think we have to be great scholars of the English language to know the difference between will and shall, do we? Sometimes we just use those words interchangeably. But you can't do that, saints. Will means one thing, shall means something else. Will has to do with your will. If you will save your life, here's a promise. We love God's promises. You shall lose it. Shall is a, a predictive word. It is, it is certainty. You shall. It's got nothing to do with your will. It's what's going to happen. And when the Lord says, if you will save your life, you shall lose it. On the other hand, if you will lose your life for his sake, you shall save it. And that's what the Lord said. So time is short. There's much remains to be done. We have two promises that we're supposed to claim, two prayers that we're supposed to pray. I remember God gave me this way back in 1956. And I was... Uh, in a little church in Joseph, Oregon. And the same day I got this word, I got word that the five guys had been martyred in Ecuador, front page news at that time. And I remember that the Lord said to me, pray ye that the, that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest. And I began to pray that, and I've prayed it over the years. I've continued to pray it. Sometimes I haven't been faithful to pray it, but I, I have prayed it frequently and still do. And the other verse was, ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And I remember that when I heard that, I heard it in my ear. It was right here. I heard the voice in my ear say, ask of me, I'll give you the heathen for my ear inheritance. No, it was this ear. <laughs> my left ear, I remember. And I thought, that's a scripture. I think I read that somewhere. So I went to my concordance and I found it in 2.8. Psalm 2.8. And I thought, but that's God talking to the Father. And I realized, yeah, or that's God talking to the Son. And I realized, yeah, but the Son is the head of the body of which I'm a part. And I began to pray that. I began to pray, God, give us the heathen. And I still pray that. And I believe God's answering prayer. I think there are probably millions of people all over the world praying that. And God's hearing it. And God's doing it. So we need to be praying those things. And do you, as some, pick and choose your promises? Like, uh, Lord... Lord, you've made this promise. You, made, you promised me you'd never leave me nor forsake me. You promised all of these things. And we hold God to his promises, don't we? And some of the promises we hold him to are promises that have conditions attached. But we don't meet the conditions. And yet we want to hold God to his promises. Saints, if we're going to hold God to his promises, let's go before the Lord and meet the conditions. God God would have us to do that. He wants that. So, becoming available is not geographical or occupational. It's motivational. It's a matter of the heart and commitment to the leadership of the Spirit of God. So, we want to be available to God. And it's real simple. It's real simple. Just having our hearts in tune with the Holy Spirit continually and recognizing how nothing we are, 
and how great he is. <clears throat> so, Father, we just call on you today to make us available, Lord, and Father, keep our hearts pure. And Lord, we realize, Father, that there are lots of things that pop up into our hearts and into our minds that, that uh, do not originate with you. So Father, give us discernment of what the difference is. Give us repentance, Lord, that we might quickly dispense with those things that, that uh, challenge our availability to your Holy Spirit. Lord, we just give this to you now, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus.